It's a pleasure to be again speaking to you, and uh, especially on the topic of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Um, you know, uh, not only the bishop uh, who ordained me, but also, too, um, working with his cause now. Uh, I really think he would be an enormous blessing to the church for his canonization, beatification and canonization. And we are really not that far from the beatification. We're only three steps away. Uh, problem is, uh, we're like a ship out at sea with the motor off. We're not moving anywhere. So but once we get past this, um, uh, our little obstacle of, about the body, um, I think the beatification will come immediately. You know, we have that case of a little boy who uh, was stillborn and he had no life signs. He had triple zero, no brain waves, no heartbeat, no breathing. And he was examined four different times. And um, they, uh, after 61 minutes without any life signs, um, they were actually signing his death certificate. And the little boy started to breathe. And the mother, all through it all, she kept invoking Fulton Sheen, Fulton Sheen. So uh, it's already been presented to Rome, that case. and. They, the medical team in Rome studied it, and uh, all seven members of the medical team said there is no known natural or human explanation for how this little child began to breathe. So uh, that clears the way to a miracle. Uh, the, the theologians, seven of them who studied the case, said it was clear that the only one invoked in this situation was Archbishop Fulton Sheen. So they said he would be the one responsible for this uh, miracle or whatever, you know, for this intercession. Uh, and that's where it stopped because the next step is to examine the body. And, uh, and right now there's a difference uh, over the body, you know, be, between New York and Peoria. So that hopefully, please pray that we can break through that impasse. Uh, I really believe that Bishop Sheen would be a great great saint in America. You know, he wrote, a, he wrote a, um, an editorial. He wrote for two different newspapers. He wrote editorials. He wrote for one, one newspaper for 15 years and another one for um, seven years. And one of his editorials was, America Needs a Saint, uh, by which he meant a homegrown American saint. Because I think at the time he wrote that, I think the only saint we had in America was Mother Cabrini, and she was a naturalized citizen. So he said, we need a homegrown American saint, somebody from the heartland of America. And uh, he was proposing Bishop Ford of Marinol, who was martyred in China. Uh, Bishop Ford was from Brooklyn. I never thought of Brooklyn as the heartland of America. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> well, <laughs> a wonderful place, but <laughs> not exactly the heartland of America when you think of that. But um, he proposed him. and. Uh, I, I said, you know, I think maybe the saint we need now is Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Uh, if we could begin with a little prayer to the Holy Spirit, to Our Lady. Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. Shall we merely receive it? Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us by this same Spirit to be truly wise, endeavor to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray to our Blessed Lady, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray. and Servant of God, Archbishop Sheen. Pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, fathers, I don't know if there's any sisters here, women, okay. Uh, but I want to uh, greet you with the greeting of Saint Francis. May the Lord give you his peace. You know, whenever Bishop Sheen gave talks, many times he would begin with a little story or two. So I'd like to share one, a little story that uh, he told when one time he was traveling by train down to Philadelphia. And when he got to the station there, he didn't know where the city hall was. He had to go there to give a talk. And there was a young boy there, a little boy at the station, and he said to him, son, where is the city hall here? 
you know, in Philadelphia. And the little boy didn't know who Bishop Sheen was, and he began to give him directions. Well, you have to go down this street about three blocks, you bet, and then you have to turn right and go left. And then he, he finally he said to Bishop Sheen, I think I better take you there so you don't get lost. So as they're going along, you know, the little boy got curious, and he said to Bishop Sheen, he said, what are you going to do at the city hall? And the bishop said, I'm going to talk to a group of people. And the little boy said to him, um, well, what are you going to tell them? And he said, I'm going to tell them how to get to heaven. And the little boy looked up at him and he said, you can't do that. You couldn't even get to the city hall. <laughs> you know, he also told a story where one time he was at St. Patrick's Cathedral. This was St. Patrick's Cathedral when he was on radio, Monsignor Sheen. He was standing in the back of St. Patrick's. And this man came up to him, saw the Roman collar, didn't know who he was. And he said to him, Father, Father, can I go to confession? You know, um, I, I'm, I'm very angry. You know, that Monsignor Sheen on one of his programs, he said something that upset two of my Protestant friends, and I'm really angry at him, and I, I think I've got to go to confession. <laughs> and Sheen said to him, look, look, I know you're, you're upset. Look, you don't have any meanness in your heart, no revenge or anything. You're upset. You know, I get upset about him a lot myself, he said. So <laughs> he told the guy, you don't have to go to confession. You can wait till your next regular time for confession. And as he was leaving, the guy said to him, you know, if only there were more priests in the church like you. <laughs> <laughs> so you say you never knew what he was going to run into, you know. Let me go through a little bit of his life so you have a little bit of idea, idea about him, and, um, and then we'll go on to his love of the priesthood. You know? uh, he was born in El Paso, Illinois on uh, May 8th, 1895, okay? And um, he was the, the oldest of four brothers. Three of them came right in a row there. Um, his father was Newton Sheen. His mother was Delia Fulton. Now, when he was baptized, he was baptized Peter John Sheen, okay? But what happened with that name, Fulton, is that he was a colic child, and so he cried an awful lot. In fact, one neighbor said that child never stops crying. So the maternal grandparents, the Fultons, would come and help their daughter, and they would take him, stroll him, little Fulton, around the, the town, and, uh, and people kept saying, that's Fulton's kid, Fulton's kid, and... Um, he liked the name, and when his grandfather took him to the cathedral school to sign up, you know, for, for school there, the, the nun asked, what's his name? And he said, his name is Fulton. And um, years later, somebody said to him, you know, there's no St. Fulton. He said, not yet. <laughs> and so that name stuck with him, Fulton J. Sheen. And uh, uh, the day he was uh, baptized, his mother placed him on the altar of the Blessed Mother, and dedicated him to Our Lady. And he said, he said, all through my life, I felt the uh, influence of that dedication pulling me toward Our Blessed Lady. Uh, he went to the, the parish school there. One thing happened when he was about eight years old. He was serving mass there at the, the school. Um, Bishop Spaulding, uh, sorry, he was ser serving at the cathedral. Bishop Spaulding was the uh, celebrant and he dropped the, the cruet, one of the cruets, and it shattered. And he used to say in his talks, nothing sounds as loud as a, as a cruet shattering on a marble floor in a cathedral in the presence of a bishop. <laughs> and after the mass was over, the, the bishop called him over and thought he was going to get a scolding. And the bishop said to him, son, where are you going to go to school when you're older? And, he, and there was already a high school named after Bishop Spaulding. It was the Spaulding Institute. So he said, I'm going to go to the Spaulding Institute. It sounded like a politically correct answer, you see. And um, the bishop said, no, I don't mean that. He said, you go home and you tell your parents that someday you will go to the University of Louvain in Belgium as I did. And you will be a bishop as I am. He was eight years old when the bishop told him that. So he went to that uh, school, you know, the Spalding, uh, the grammar school, St. Mary's Cathedral Grammar School, then the Spalding Institute, and, um, which was staffed by the Brothers of Mary at the time. He then attended St. Viator College in Bourbonnet, Illinois. And there's two very important things that happened. <clears throat> he was on the debate team 
And um, it was the night before little St. Viator College was going to debate the University of Notre Dame. It was like, uh, you know, David and Goliath, huh? And um, the Father Bagan, who was the head of the debate team, he called young Fulton over and he said to him, um, Fulton, you are one of the worst students I've ever had for public speaking. You have absolutely no natural talent as a speaker. You, know, you listen to his talks and you say, how could you possibly say that, huh? So he said, I want you to give the talk you're going to give tomorrow in the debate. So he, did, he went through the talk, and Father Bacon said, all right, do it again. Do it again, five times. And finally he said to young Fulton, do you know what you're doing wrong? He said, I think I'm not being myself. He said, that's exactly right. Well, the next day, <laughs> for the first time ever, and maybe the last time ever, little St. Viator College defeated the University of Notre Dame in the debate. And he never forgot that. At the end of his college experience, he entered a national scholarship, um, a, a scholarship contest. And he was a national winner. Now, I'm, we're talking 1915. He won a scholarship worth about $15,000. I wonder how much that would be worth today, maybe 150000 I don't know. Um, it entitled him to go three years of postgraduate work in room and board being paid for. So he runs to see Father Begum with this scholarship that he had just got, won. He said, Father, look, I've won that scholarship. And Father Begum challenged him. And he, 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 when he referred to this incident, he said, there are events in your life that will change, change you. And this was one of them. He said, Father Begum said to him, uh, Fulton, rip that up. But Father, I, I, you know, I can go to any university I want, get a, a, you know, a doctorate in any degree I want, and, you know, and, and, and Father Bacon said, but Fulton, you know you have a vocation to the priesthood. He said, but Father, I, I can go get this doctorate first, then I can go to the seminary. And Father Bacon said to him, Fulton, you don't put off the call of Christ. You know what he did? He ripped up. $15,000, like that. And uh, he never turned back. And he went up to St. Paul's Seminary up in Minnesota, and he was ordained on um, September 20th, 1919, in that cathedral where he dropped the cruet. Hmm? And the bishop told him that he would be a bishop someday. Um, after he, he, and he renewed his, uh, uh, his uh, desire to offer Mass every Saturday when the liturgy permitted it, in honor of the Blessed Mother, because of his great love of Our Lady. In the seminary, I have to mention this, this is very important, um, he began a practice of the, uh, the Eucharistic Holy Hour. Did I mention, I don't think I mentioned that in my talk to you yesterday, did I? Eucharistic Holy Hour? Okay, it was to the seminarians then I mentioned. Um, see, what happened, uh, he got, he heard of an incident that happened in China. It was a little girl about 12 years old, and she was in the church when the boxers took control of the town and they, they broke open into the church. They broke open the tabernacle and um, the priest was put under house arrest. There was always a soldier, a guard, guarding the, the, the priest. And um, uh, they forced open the tabernacle and took all the hosts, and consecrated hosts, and threw the body of Christ all over the sanctuary. You know? Now that little girl saw this. Now, whether the soldiers saw her or they didn't mind that she saw this, that little girl was so affected. Now, the priest knew he had 32 hosts in the tabernacle. For 32 nights, that little girl came back to the church, climbed in a window on the opposite side of the church from where the priest was, okay? And um, she would pray in adoration to the Blessed Sacrament, and then on her hands and knees every night, she would lick up another host. She wouldn't take the host in her fingers because those days the laity did not touch the, the Eucharist like that. So she licked up a host every night. The last night, the priest eventually began to see her coming and going, and he saw her that night, and uh, as and he realized it was the 32nd night, as he saw the little girl leaving the church, she made noise and she woke the guard up. And the guard, the little girl panicked and she started to run, and the guard ran after her. And with his gun, his rifle, he beat that little girl to death. Now, the priest saw that. 
and relayed that story. <clears throat> and young Fulton Sheen, it was in second year theology when he heard that, he and a couple of his classmates said that if that little girl could have so much courage that for 32 nights she risked her life for Jesus in the Eucharist, um, I can spend one hour of every day of my life making a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament. And so that's where the inspiration of his holy hour came from. That little girl who was heroic in her love for Christ in the Eucharist. We don't even know, to my knowledge, don't know her name, um, but uh, certainly heroic. Huh? Um, and so he kept that. He kept that faithfully all next for 62 years. You know, and no matter whether he was traveling, I remember I, I heard from an, uh, one of the uh, missionaries, or his, um, he, was a, he was a priest who belonged to a missionary order, and he told me that uh, his, some of his men were in a mission in Africa, and the bishop arrived there at 2.30 in the morning, and he didn't ask for a, a meal, he didn't ask for a bed, he asked, where is the blessed sacrament? He wanted to make his holy hour, and so he, he made his holy hour faithfully, and um, uh, sometimes it was difficult. One time he was traveling by train. He, he arrived in this certain place, and he had three hours to get another train out. And he found the church, and he went in. I guess he was so exhausted and tired that, you know, he, he fell asleep for the whole hour. And, um, and he said, uh, when he woke up, he said, Lord, did that holy hour count? And he seemed to think our Lord said to him, well, that's the way the apostles made the first one. You know? <laughs> so, so yeah. Sometimes he would actually have to stand right in front of the church looking through the crack in the door at the tabernacle so he could make his holy hour that way. Sometimes he got locked in the church. The sexton let him in and forgot he was in there and locked up the church. He had to climb one time out through the confessional, out over the, you know, climb up to the top of the confessional, out the window, another time through a coal bin. So, but he was faithful. And he called it the hour of power. And uh, he said he did that for perseverance in his call and fidelity, and I'm sure was a source of many of the graces of his priesthood. After ordination, his bishop um, would, wanted to send him to Catholic University. The, the bishop there um, was uh, a founder, one of the co-founders of Catholic University, and so he was sent there to get his doctorate. He wanted to study the theology of St. Thomas to deal with the problems of modern time, okay? And um, he went there for two years, and after two years, he was really disappointed in the quality of the teaching about St. Thomas. And he asked around, where can I get the best teaching on St. Thomas? And they said, you have to go to Louvain in Europe. So to Louvain he went. Hmm? And so that the bishop's words, you will go to Louvain as I did. And they were so impressed. So he got his doctorate there, his first one. It seems that he got another one uh, in the following year, which he probably got at the Angelicum in Rome. Um, but he, um, uh, he, was, he so impressed them that they invited him to study for a super doctorate called the Agrigé degree. And uh, no American had ever received that before. And uh, so he had to study for about two years for that. They brought professors in, maybe as many as 200 professors would attend this. It was an all day oral exam and, and they would grill him. And he was grilled, huh? And uh, then after you take that exam, you go to your room. If you get a knock on the door, it's a good sign because it means you passed and they have a meal to celebrate, okay? If you didn't get a knock on the door, you know, you knew where McDonald's was, okay? <laughs> okay. So anyway, you could tell how well you did by what they served as a drink at the, the dinner. If you just passed, you got water. If you did a little bit better, they served beer. If you did very well, you got wine. And if you did exceptionally well, you got champagne. Well, he had buckets and buckets of champagne. That's how well he did. Um, so he certainly was a very learned man. In fact, um, his reputation, you know, was quite impressive. His friend, Father Ronald Knox at Oxford, invited him to come over to Oxford to, um, you know, teach there with him, with uh, Ronald Knox. Um, he also got a, an invitation, believe, believe it or not, from uh, Columbia University in New York 
to open a chair of studies on St. Thomas Aquinas. So he calls his bishop back and contacts him back in Peoria. He said, I've got these two offers. Which one should I take? Well, some of the people in, his di in the diocese were feeding the bishop with the idea. You know, he's had such success because he also won the International Prize for Philosophy, the Cardinal Mercier International Prize, first American to win that, you know. He said, he's not going to listen to anything. He's not, never going to listen to you again. He's going to have a big head. So the bishop said, don't take either one of them. Come back to Peoria. So he goes back to Peoria, and the bishop assigns him to an inner city parish where there were four people going to Mass during the week. He went and visited every single home in that parish. By the time he left, nine months later, there were 90 people coming to Mass every day. And the other pastors were getting furious, you know, jealousy and everything. Don't go down there to listen to that young priest. That's not your parish. And they came in droves. So finally, the bishop called them in. He said, well, I promised you that you could teach at Catholic University. So he sent them off in 1926. Now, there's one other little incident I want to mention because it's very, very insightful and interesting. Um, he, during the summers, for about seven different summers, he would go to England and he would prepare his notes for the next year. And um, he, he went to a place called St. Patrick's in Soho Square in London. Soho Square at that time was like the old Times Square in New York. It was a seamy place and, you know. So he was on duty this one day and the doorbell rang. And he goes to answer the door and there's a woman there and she collapses, you know. He reaches down to pick her up and he, she sees his Roman collar Oh, she said, oh, thank you, Father. He said, oh, you're a Catholic. She said, yes, I am. He said, who are you? And she pointed to a marquee across the, the square. He said, you see that theater, the marquee there, that, that name? I'm the leading lady in that, in that play. Well, what happened was the lady had had three boyfriends, and they were all finding out about each other. So, of course, where do you go? You go to the local rectory <laughs> to talk to Father to help you get out of the, the hot water, huh? Right? So, so she came to see a priest, and, um, but, she, but in order to do that, she, she drank quite a bit, okay? So she wasn't making any sense, and he said to her, would you come back when you're feeling better? She said, I will, but on one condition. He said, what's that? Yet you promise me you will not ask me to go to confession. All right, I promise you I will not ask you to go to confession. As she was leaving, she got him to promise a second time. You promise me? You will not ask me to go to confession? I promise you. I will not ask you to go to confession. And finally, when she came back later feeling much better, she said, now remember, will you promise again that you will not ask me to go to confession? I promise you I will not ask you to go to confession. Well, he talked to her for a while. She felt much better. And she was ready to leave. He said, you know, have you ever seen the inside of our church? We have a very beautiful church next door here. Can I show you some of the artwork in the church? So they're walking down the aisle, and he's pointing out, you know, artwork on the ceiling and on the walls of the church and the stained glass and all that. When, we got, when he got by the confessional, he pushed her right in. See, he kept his promise. He didn't ask her to go to <laughs> The woman made a confession of her whole life and ended up becoming one of those Benedictine cloistered nuns at Tyburn, which is just a short ways away from there. Uh, where the martyrs, the English, English martyrs were killed in Tyburn. There's a perpetual adoration of the Tyburn Benedictines. She was a nun for 40 years. So it wasn't a fluky kind of conversion. It was the real thing. Um, when he came back, he went to teach at Catholic University from 1926 to 1950. So he was there for 24 years. And in 1930... Um, the bishops of the United States, or the Catholic men, the uh, National Conference of Catholic Men, wanted to have a national radio program. And they wanted Fulton Sheen to be the host of that program. See, he had begun when he was teaching at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. On weekends, he would go up to New York, he would go down to, you know, uh, other places, Philadelphia, and so on. And he would begin to preach. He preached at St. Paul's Church on 59th Street in New York, and, um, and the crowds would come, and he would be, his, some of his, his talks were broadcast locally. 
So he, he had a reputation as a speaker. So the, the uh, Catholic man asked him to come. It was at 6 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and uh, he was on for half an hour. It was called the Catholic Hour, but it was a half-hour program. And they estimate that by the time he stepped down in 1950, he had a, a listening audience of about 4 to 5 million people on a Sunday evening. Okay? So he became a national voice. And then what happened was he got transferred from, from Washington from his assignment at Catholic University up to New York to become the national director of the propagation of the faith. He used to say, the missions of the church were always my first love. So he went there, and his work, his great work, was to uh, raise funds for the missions and send money out all over, you know. Uh, I've met, I met a man who told me that he knew these Baptists. Uh, they were in the South. They were uh, African Americans, and uh, they were being persecuted by the Klan. They wanted to build a church, and so they wrote to him, could you help us build a church? And they told him of, uh, told him of their situation, and he sent them $5,000 to build a church. And the man who told me the story, he said, you know, they love your man. He said to me, that's the way he put it. They love your man because of what he did for them. Uh, by the way, he had a great love for the poor. He had a great love for minorities and, uh, you know, social, the rights of people. And, uh, you know, so he, he was very, very keen on that. Very keen. Um, so he went up to New York, and um, through the good graces at the time of Cardinal Spellman, he was consecrated a bishop in Rome at the uh, American church there, the Church of uh, uh, St. John and Paul, on June 11, 1951. Now, Cardinal Piazza was the one who consecrated him, along with two other bishops. Now, when he came back in 1951, the Dumont Network, which later on, I think, became ABC, the Dumont Network wanted to have a religious program. See, at that time, all the major networks had to have a half-hour religious programming. So they decided to get Fulton Sheen. All right, he had just become a new bishop. So they put him on television. That was his program, you know, the, the uh, uh, life is worth living. And um, he was on for half an hour. Now, they deliberately put him opposite Milton Berle. Milton Berle was Mr. Television. Milton Berle was on Tuesday night from 8 to 9. They put Bishop Sheen on Tuesday night from 8 to 8.30. They figured nobody's going to listen to it anyway. Okay, that was their thinking. Within six months, most of the people, the viewers who were watching Milton Berle were watching Bishop Sheen from 8 to 8.30. Then they, at 8.30, they turned back to Milton Berle. In fact, Milton Berle said, and remember, he was Jewish. He said, if I had to li lose a good part of my viewing audience to anybody, I couldn't think of anybody better to lose it to than to the, to the man Bishop Sheen represents, who's Jesus. So that was a comment. Remember, the secular press <laughs> began <laughs> to talk about Uncle Fulty, Uncle Milty and Uncle Fulty. Huh? And that, what do you call it? And you know, it's amazing with something that could really be a source of great, jealousy and, uh, you know, um, just envy. There was no bitterness between them. It's interesting. Um, so anyway, he was on, and in that first full year on television, 1952, he won an Emmy as the most outstanding personality on television. He, in, the, in the voting, he, he outscored Lucille Ball, Jimmy Durante, Edward R. Morrow. So you could tell he was popular, the most outstanding personality on television. And when he went to get his uh, Emmy, you know how everybody, they thank their producers, directors, he says, I want to thank my writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> so, so, so he had won this great Emmy. And he had between 25 and 30 million people watching him on a Tuesday night. I told that to an assistant producer for ABC, no, CBS. He was stunned. And you know, of the religious groups in the United States, the major ones, Catholics, Protestants, and Jewish, the highest percentage that watched it was Jewish. The second highest was Protestant. 
third was Catholics. Hmm. Maybe the Catholics figured I had enough of that on Sunday. Hmm. But whatever. Hmm. But he was greatly, greatly, um, you know, honored. And, you know, um, they, they really admired him. In fact, that when that producer said, how do you account for that? I said, well, he told them the truth. And they, they trusted him for that. And they, they were very grateful. So he was on television then from 19... 51 to 1956, okay? In 1956, he basically was removed from television. He would never talk about it, you know? He had some trouble at that time, you know, with Cardinal Spellman. He had received, as the head of the Propagation of the Faith, he had received a million dollar donation from the U.S. government to buy powder milk for children in the poor countries of the world. They figured through the Propagation of the Faith, they could get this powdered milk out to children all over the world. Well, Spellman said to Sheen that you receive that as an auxiliary bishop of New York, so I have a right to tax that money. And Sheen said, no, I didn't receive it as an auxiliary bishop of New York. I received it as the head of the propagation of the faith. You don't have a right to tax that. Well, the tension got so great. Remember, you had the most powerful bishop in America was Spellman, and the most popular bishop in America was Sheen. You know, so you had this real clash. And it got so intense that Pius XII called them both over to Rome. And he listened to both sides. And he said to Spellman, who was his close friend, in this case, Sheen is right. You cannot tax that money. That's meant for the poor and has to be given to the poor. Well, after that, you know, Bishop Sheen was basically persona non grata in New York, you know. And that's why he did a lot of preaching all over the country. Okay? And... Um, and so he, and he began, you know, his writing. He wrote 65 books. His favorite, his favorite was The World's First Love about the Blessed Mother. Some great ones on the priesthood, you know, he, the priest is not his own, and those mysterious priests, you know, powerful books on the priesthood. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, some of the, his great book on the life of Christ, you know, great for meditating on the life of Christ. So his writing and so on. Now, in 1966, oh, he was at the council. He went to all the sessions at the council. And whenever he was next, he was announced that he was the next speaker. All the bishops who usually went out to those little coffee clutches, you know, there, they came back in to hear him speak. And he was at all four sessions of the council. When they asked him, when they asked for the bishops for suggestions of topics to discuss, he suggested to talk about the role of women in the church, and he was told that's not important. It's one of the most burning issues in the church today. You know, another thing he said was you should drop the name propaganda fide from the propagation of faith. He said because the, the word propaganda in many countries it sounds like you know propaganda, and it's very negative. And some bishop attacked him. How could you dare suggest that this sacred name? And a year later, they changed the name to the pontifical, you know, world pontifical uh, missions. Uh, so he was a man who was very far ahead because remember, his view, his view was not localized to one country or one area. He had the whole world that he was dealing with, you know, especially with the missions. Now in 1966, after the council, um, he, um, he went up to Rochester and uh, he became Bishop of Rochester from 66 to 69. It wasn't a very easy thing up there, but for me, <laughs> that's where I got ordained by him. I was a student in, uh, we had a little seminary in Geneva, New York, and, and my director asked, will you ordain Brother Andrew? And sure enough, we took a little trouble getting past his secretary who only wanted to set his schedule for one week in advance, so you can't get ordained in a week. Uh, but finally, we got to the bishop, and he said, I, would ord I told you I would ordain him and I will. He stepped down in 1969. I think he felt he was a failure. He spoke to Pope Paul VI. He was very close to Pope Paul VI. And he, four times he asked the Pope to accept his resignation. The first three times the Pope wouldn't even listen to it. Finally, the fourth time he pleaded with the Pope. And the Pope accepted his resignation. He didn't want him to step down, you know, feeling that he was a failure. Uh, but he knew there was opposition. He said he went to one parish to talk and the little kids threw stones at his car. He said, little kids don't do that spontaneously. So he, he felt he had become ineffective, 
And one of, the, one of the things I think brought on a lot of difficulty for him, I told you that he was very much a person of great justice. And um, uh, the big company, uh, big, uh, you know, uh, company for employment in, in Rochester was uh, Kodak. And Kodak had promised some minority people uh, better pay and jobs and everything, but they reneged on that. And he commented on that, see? And that must have infuriated a lot of the priests in the diocese because their people work for Kodak. And the people must have been telling them that the bishop's you know, making things very, very difficult for us with his comments. But that's the kind of man he was. In fact, uh, there, was a, there was a march, I don't know if it was the end of World War II, and it was segregated. The units were segregated, there, you know, and uh, there was a fence separating, you know, the Caucasian from the minority soldiers. He went and helped tear down that fence. He said, this shouldn't be, you know. That's the kind of man he was. They criticized him for a lot of things, but they never dared criticize him that he didn't have concern for the poor. He had a great concern, you know, for the poor. Well, his last 10 years, he basically used, I think, in giving retreats, and particularly for the renewal of the priesthood, okay? And so I'd like to, he died on, um, he died on uh, October, no, I'm sorry, December the 9th, 1979. Uh, shortly after he had, you know, uh, Pope John Paul II had come to the United States for his first visit, Remember, in 1979, and he visited St. Patrick's Cathedral, and maybe you've seen that picture of uh, the Pope embracing Bishop Sheen there in St. Patrick's Cathedral, and he said to Bishop Sheen, you have written and spoken well of the Lord Jesus. You are a loyal son of the church. And Bishop Sheen said, you know, of the many things that were said about me and to me, I always hold that as probably the greatest tribute. Uh, John Paul and he were very good friends, you know. So let's say a little bit about... Um, his thoughts on the priesthood, okay? Um, I know uh, for me, you know, he's had such an impact on my, my life, you know. Um, at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, there's a statue of St. John Vianney. And on the bottom of it, who's now patron saint of all priests, and on the bottom of that statue, the beautiful words, the priesthood is the joy of the heart of Jesus. And I know that it was the joy of Bishop Sheen also to be a priest. He said in his autobiography, Treasure in Clay, I cannot remember a time when I did not want to be a priest. Uh, he wrote those books I mentioned, this Priest is Not His Own, Those Mysterious Priests. And his books and tapes even now are helping many priests to remain faithful. Uh, Monsignor Franco, um, who uh, recently put out a book on I think from some letters from Bishop Sheen. Um, he lived and worked with Bishop Sheen for about five years at the Propagation of the Faith. And he told me that he was in Africa in 1999. There was big gatherings of priests. Remember, he had big gatherings all over the world. And uh, he was up on the, on the platform. He didn't speak, but he was simply introduced as a priest who had lived and worked with Fulton Sheen. And um, he said after the talks were over, all these African priests came to him and said we're being kept going by Bishop Sheen's books and his tapes, hmm? inspiring um, so much. I remember a seminarian telling me there's so much in this book, the priest is not his own, that I have to read it slowly to absor absorb it all. Huh? And uh, many of these books now have been reprinted in recent years. See? As a bishop, he loved to ordain men. And um, first thing he said in the homily at my ordination was this, one of the great joys of being a bishop is the power of generation. It is given to a bishop to have sons in Christ through the power of ordination, to prolong into another generation sons upon whom he has given the august power of the priesthood. So and what were those powers? He described the power of mass. He said the, the powers that are given simply in a few words are staggering. One of the powers, for example, is to go to the hill of Calvary and take up the cross, to plant it down in Geneva, in the Capuchin Monastery, in Africa, in Asia, or in any city or village. This, he said, is the power of offering mass. It is the prolongation in space and time 
of the redemptive work of our Lord. What our Lord did on Calvary, in a certain sense, was localized. What we do by the Mass is to apply it all over the world. Our Lord wrote the first note in this melody of redemption. And by the Mass, we add our own notes to it. And this is the harmony of the people of God. So, so he stressed also the power of absolution. Uh, you know, he's, he said that um, there, then there is the power to forgive sins. You will never forget your first absolution. I, I never forgot mine either. I was so nervous. I, I had just gotten my faculties. I, I was a simplex priest for about three months. I was ordained early, but didn't take my exam until June, July, and, you know. Um, it may manifest, he said, some power to send a man to the moon, which was just happening at that time. But what is that in comparison to sending sins into nothingness? A raised hand and a voice, your sins are forgiven. And quite apart, even from our consciousness of that power, the people themselves feel it and know when they have received absolution. So, um, his insights into the understanding of the priesthood, he took much from Scripture. One of his first beautiful comparisons was the priest, uh, the priest and victim. Okay? Um, he says, this is what distinguishes Christ's priesthood from the Old Testament priesthood and from the, the pagan priests. See, the Old Testament priests, the pagan priests, when they offered a victim, it was always apart from themselves. A lamb, a bullock, the first fruits. But when Jesus was priest, he was also the victim, for he offered himself. And, um, and so St. Paul could say, my life is being poured out like a libation. My life is at the service of the gospel. And we as priests, you know, do that also. So we are priest and victim. In fact, in his book, the Priest is Not His Own, he says that in the introduction. He said, if you don't believe that you're, you are both priest and victim with Christ, don't bother reading this book. Because the whole book is based on that. He talked about the cross. He said this was at the heart of the priestly vocation. He said of priests that they were crucified on the vertical beam of their God-given vocation and on the horizontal beam of the simple longing of the flesh. Okay? He said, the priest is called to be the happiest of men, and yet daily is committed to the greatest of all wars, the one waged within. Hmm? So the priest had to be faithful, he said, carrying out God's will and faithful to the people, proclaiming the message in season and out of season. One of his other analogies that uh, he took from Scripture was the priest as Simon and Peter. Okay? Simon, the old man, the paradox, huh? the priest, exalted in Christ, yet weak in, in our humanity. He said, it, 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 this is clear in his contrast then of St. Peter as both Simon and Peter. Simon was the old man, rooted in the ways of fallen nature. He had worldly wisdom, right? Remember when he tried to talk Jesus out of the cross? And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You think the thoughts of men, not of God, huh? His weakness later on, in which he would deny the Lord three times. And we all have that weakness. We carry weakness within us. So there's part of us that is Simon. But there's part of us, part of us like Peter. Huh? You know, uh, Jesus created Peter's name. Remember, there was no name Peter. He made that up. You know, you see it, you see it in the Greek. Uh, Petra is rock. But the A made it feminine. So he just put OS, or at least when it's translated, OS, huh? It was masculine. And so he made up a name, Rock. Bishop Jean said he called him Rocky. <laughs> he was a little bit rocky, wasn't he? Huh? So he proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah, Son of the Living God. He believed in the teaching of the Eucharist when the crowds walked away. As Jesus said to them, Will you leave me? As if to say, if you don't believe in, in it. When I'm telling you, go with them. Huh? But Peter said, Lord, whom, whom, can we go, whom shall we go to? We have come to believe in you. You alone have the words of eternal life. So he stayed, hmm? the faith of the church. And then even after his threefold denial, he was to confirm his brothers in the church. So feed my lambs and feed my sheep. Uh, 
a beautiful touching scene there after the resurrection, remember? And Jesus said to him, um, in, the, in the Greek, you get it more clearly than you do in the English. In English, we have one word for love. But in the Greek, you know, the first two times Jesus asked him, do you have agape love for me? That full, total, complete, self-sacrificing love. And Peter was afraid to say that. So he answered, I have love for you. I have filia love. Like a love of friendship back and forth. It's not as total, not as sacrificial as agape love. And finally, the third time Jesus asked him, do you have filia love for me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, that's what I have. Filia love. And he was to remain faithful. And so in our own lives, we feel at times Simon, the old man, pulling, falling, weak. But then Peter restored to the love of Christ. And he remained faithful. We have that struggle between the old man and the new, the spirit that's willing and the flesh that's weak. Archbishop Sheen, in his own life, um, he recognized the dignity of the priesthood and yet human weakness. Remember, he entitled his, his autobiography, Treasure in Clay. The treasure was the priesthood. The clay was human weakness. This is what one author said. How did Fulton Sheen see his life? He saw it as a priest, no longer his own, but at every moment acting in the person of Christ. He was to be always an ambassador of Christ. That is one side of the coin. The other is the priest as a man. That is the contrast that Bishop Sheen saw in his life and why he chose the title of his autobiography as Treasure in Clay. The title came from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians about himself and the other apostles being no better than pots of earthenware containing the treasure. He thought the title illustrated the nobility of the vocation to the priesthood and the frailty of the human nature that houses it. Mm. Um, let me skip a little bit here because I'm running out of time. I want to get to um, something later on in his life. Um, when I was ordained by him, he spoke about how the priests are losing, they're becoming, they're losing their identity, not attracting, you know. And he knew the problems that were entering into the priesthood, okay? One of the most important converts that he made, he made about, they estimate 52,000 converts that we know of, that he had, okay? And um, one of the most important of them, the, the most important and outstanding was, was Claire Booth Luce. She was going to take her life after her daughter died, and he asked to see her, and he she came, and he kept talking about God's love and mercy, and she screamed at him, how could God be loving and merciful if he took my daughter? And he said, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. And she became a great convert. But there's one other lady I want to tell you about. You may have heard about her, maybe not. Her name was Bella Dodd. Bella Dodd grew up in the Bronx, and she was a, uh, a lawyer. She became a socialist, and in 1930 entered the Communist Party. Now, the head of the party at that time was Joseph Stalin. And Stalin, I don't know if you know this, but he was in a seminary, got thrown out for reading pornography. He, he had read Darwin and came to the conclusion that we are simply just developed animals and that's it. Okay. He said, in 1930, Stalin, as head of the Communist Party, said that the greatest enemy communism has is the Roman Catholic Church. And the way to destroy it is to get men into the priesthood who have no faith, no morality, get them through the seminaries, get them ordained, and they will cause havoc in the seminary. Have you ever read a, read a little book called AA1025? Okay, it's been reproduced a couple of years ago by Tan Books. AA1025 means anti-apostle. This is exactly the kind of people she was recruiting. When Bishop Sheen converted her 20 years later, he told her, she told him, I personally recruited about 1,100 men to enter the priesthood to destroy the Catholic Church from within. And she knew that. She also told him, we had four people, cardinals, high up in the Vatican, who were masons working with the communists. You know, so he knew the church had been infiltrated. Okay? That's probably why Paul VI, who was very close to Bishop Sheen, said that this, the... the uh, the uh, odor of, of Satan has entered even 
into the sanctuary of the church. So he worked, you know, to, uh, you know, work for the renewal of the priesthood. He said, this is what we need. He said, if there is any key to the renewal, the reform of the church today and the salvation of the world today, it lies in the renewal of the priesthood. So fathers, if you ever get discouraged, know that you have been entrusted by Jesus, you know, with a great mission, you know, to be priests. Um, I forget who it was that uh, somebody told me he was walking down a corridor with a nun and and he stopped to let her go by. She wouldn't go by. She said, well, not even an angel walks in front of a priest. Hmm? That's what she said to him. And so we have been very blessed. And sometimes there are discouraging days. We get discouraged with ourselves, our own personal weaknesses, our struggles. But even out of our struggles, God lifts us up. Even the Lord himself, with the, uh, bearing the cross, tradition says he fell a number of times. And so as priests, we know failure at times. But you know what? You can get right back up. The Lord's mercy is overwhelming. And we have been entrusted to be, you know, the bearers of that great mercy. So, Fathers, it's been my pleasure. Maybe someday we can say St. Fulton Sheen. I hope so. Please pray for that. God love you. I know. Okay. Mm -hmm.